I'm going to begin recording today's presentation, and I'm delighted to officially welcome everybody to the Lympha Press Educational Webinar Series with Dr. Karen Herbst. We are ending Lympha lipedema awareness month with a bang because dr herbst is the renowned leader in this field and we are so proud that when i give her bio i can also say she is the chief medical officer of lympha press and she has many affiliations her resume is so long it would take most of the webinar time to announce it but most recently, Dr. Herbst headed up an NIH-sponsored conference to establish the standard of care for lipedema in the United States. And in 2020, she presented new ICD-10 codes for lipedema and Durkheim's disease to the CDC. She not only is one of the most respected individuals in this field, but has a genuine heart for the patient population. And that's why she's been such a great match with Lympha Press, patients first. That's really what it's all about. And so I will introduce lipedema, cooling the fire within. Inflammation is part of the underlying disease called lipedema. Dr. Herbst is going to explore theories on why inflammation is present in lipedema tissue and what patients can do to quench this fire. I know there is so much interest in this topic, and I now yield the floor to you, Dr. Herbst. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brenda. It's really a pleasure to be here, and it's what a great honor it is to end Lipedema Awareness Month. I know you've had so many good webinars. There's just been so much activity going on during this month. It is just really heartening to see and hear um, I was just at the USC conference and they were talking about, at least in my session, lymphedema and lipedema. And one of the big topics was inflammation. So this is definitely a good topic for today. Can't get my, oh, there we go. So here are my disclosures. So inflammation, what does it mean? I've been into this big definition phase. Whenever I, I see a word, I define it. And you learn so much. So inflammation means to set on fire. So if you have lipedema or lymphedema, uh, your tissue is definitely on fire. And the Roman Celsus first described the four cardinal signs of inflammation, rubor or redness, tumor or swelling, calor or heat, and dolor or pain. So if you have any of these signs, you could definitely have inflammation. And one of the things that a lot of women tell me is I'm always hot. And that really makes me think that they may have um, complete systemic inflammation from the brain on down. So just to set the stage for this talk, this is a cartoon of fat tissue. And you can see the big yellow cell here is an adipocyte and in the center of it is a bunch of stored triglyceride and you can see around the outside of it is the extracellular matrix and the extracellular matrix is made up of fibers and some of those are shown here like um, the collagen fibrils but also other fibrils and you can imagine that this web of extracellular matrix is extending way out from the cell but obviously they couldn't show that or it would cover up everything else on this cartoon. Also within the extracellular matrix are immune cells like macrophages, eosinophils, mast cells, but they're also fibroblasts which stimulate inflammation. And one of the most important parts of the extracellular matrix is hyaluronic acid or hyaluronin, which is the red line shown here. And you can see that um, hyaluronin interacts directly with the cell and uh, uh, like the adipocyte and immune cells, but also other parts of the extracellular matrix. And it binds up other proteins to which other glycosaminoglycans bind. So hyaluronic acid is a glycosaminoglycan. It's a sugar molecule, but it doesn't have a negative charge. Whereas other glycosaminoglycans, like on that brush looking structure, do have a negative charge, but both of them bind up water and salt. 
So you can imagine if you have a lot of extra fluid in your tissue, you're gonna have a lot of those brush-like looking structures. When they bind up water and salt, they form a gel. So you're gonna have a lot of gel in your tissue and that gel is gonna make it difficult for flow. So flow from blood vessels through the tissue to lymphatics. Okay, so now we set the scene. So we're gonna talk about inflammation. So this is a cartoon of inflammation and it usually starts with an injury or infection. And you can see that right after the injury or infection, you have an increase in the number of immune cells that come into the area. And the, the first cells that come in are usually neutrophils and mast cells. And mast cells secrete histamine, which cause you to swell. And that's part of the, the two more part of, of the inflammatory process. Once um, the inflammation begins to resolve, you get a lot of macrophages. And the macrophages are coming in to, to clean up the tissue and allow uh, repair and return back to normal or adapted homeostasis. However, if the body is unable to return back to normal, you enter what's called maladapted homeostasis. And this is chronic inflammation. And when you have chronic inflammation, that can lead to autoimmunity. So this is where um, the body really is on fire, not just acutely, but chronically. So let's look at some of the data showing that we do have inflammation in lipedema tissue. So if you look over to the far left, uh, a group out of Belgium labeled immune cells with what's called CD45. And CD45 is just a general marker of, are there more white blood cells in the tissue or not? And what they found was that in women with lipedema, there were definitely more white blood cells in the tissue compared to controls or women without lipedema. And then they said, well, what, what cells are higher? So when they looked, they found macrophages were higher in lipedema than control tissue. So it looks like we're in lipedema tissue, there's that, we're in that chronic phase of cleaning up the tissue, cleaning up the tissue, but it never really fully gets cleaned up because inflammation is still occurring. And in this study by Sarah Algadban and her colleagues, um, they looked at women with lipedema who did not have obesity or women with lipedema who had obesity. And you can see they found more macrophages in the lipedema tissue compared to controls, whether the women with lipedema had obesity or they did not. So it's not dependent on obesity. It's not just, oh, you have lipedema, you have more fat tissue, you're obese, and therefore you have more macrophages, just like people with lifestyle-induced obesity. But that's not true. Because even if you don't have obesity, even if you're stage one, you still have more macrophages in the tissue. This is a, another study uh, out of, uh, what's it, Guillermo, uh, Guillermo's lab, I can't remember his last name right now, but um, they looked, they were looking for a biomarker for lymphedema, and they included women with lipedema in their study and also other lymphovascular disorders. And what they found was compared to, to uh, people who didn't have any problem with their lymphatic system, platelet factor four levels were higher, no matter what you had, lymphedema, lipedema, lymphovascular disease. And platelet factor four is kind of a general marker for inflammation. It's especially elevated in inflammation of the gut, which we will come to shortly. And when they looked at people who uh, were lean or obese and were controls, their platelet factor four levels were relatively normal. So it, 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 this marker is not dependent on obesity. And if you had a lymph, lymphatic disorder, whether you didn't have obesity or you did, it didn't matter, your platelet factor four levels were higher than controls. Does this mean you should run out and get your platelet factor four levels checked? No, because this is still in a research-based phase and it probably isn't gonna change your management unless you're definitely looking to find a marker of inflammation so you can undergo a particular treatment. And finally, when you have inflammation, things get broken up in the tissue and these little pieces of, of tissue are called antigens or a, a, an infection um, 
with a, a virus or a bacteria can get broken up and form these little pieces. And those pieces are also called antigens. And there's some cells in the tissue um, that are positive for a marker called CD11C. And these are called dendritic cells. They're antigen presenting cells. And they ask the question, are CD11C cells higher in lipidema than controls? And you can see in red here that when they took tissue from the thigh, CD11C cells were definitely higher in the thigh compared to control. But look at the lipedema abdomen. I find that to be very interesting. What if we had a few more women in the study? Do you think that the CD11C cells would be higher in the abdomen than controls? Do you think that the abdomen is affected in lipedema? And that's a big area of controversy. I actually published or I spoke at the uh, Assisi conference in Italy and uh, some of the uh, people who attended the conference from Europe were like, I'm not convinced that there's lipedema on the abdomen. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. The final outcome of, of inflammation, if the body cannot completely repair it, is fibrosis. So if the body is in chronic inflammation, it starts to lay down fibrosis, trying to contain that inflammation. And uh, the Felmer group out of Belgium, again, stained the tissue looking for fibrosis. So you can see on the bottom how much pink there is in the lipedema tissue compared to the control. And over to the right, you can see um, when they quantitated it, definitely more fibrosis in the lipedema tissue compared to the controls. So yes, there's more fibrosis in lipedema tissue. So what is causing this inflammation? If we could figure this out, we could stop it. So Sarah algod -Ban and her colleagues again looked at the small vessels in the lipedema tissue. And what they found was the small vessels, including the capillaries, were dilated. And when you have dilated vessels, they it, it's like an aneurysm in your small vessels. That is not normal. They, are, they have been damaged. So there's damage throughout the tissue, including on the level of the small vessels. So this is a cartoon of kind of what that um, tissue looks like. So you have here what's called an arterial. And so that's right before the capillary. So here comes the capillary out into the fat tissue to, to feed it. And on this arterial, you see these little purple spider-like cells, and those are called parasites. So P-E-R-I-C-Y-T-E, -E, not a parasite or a bug. And those parasites actually control the size of the vessel. So they can squeeze it and close it down so they can reduce blood flow to the fat tissue, or they can open up and allow it to expand. And another very cool thing about the parasites is they can actually convert to a stem cell, which can then make more fat cells. And in fact, in your adult life, a lot of your adipocytes come from your parasites. So they come from the vasculature. So the vasculature is very important in adipose tissue. And that's why we like to say that lipedema is a connective tissue disease because of all the other constituents of the tissue that are important, not just the fat cell. And if we slice this vessel and look at it from the side, you can see that the little purple parasites are on the outside. And then these little red cells here are endothelial cells. And those are, are the lining of the vessel. And what's really cool about these cells is they too can convert into adipocytes. And then finally, inside of the, the vessels here are, are shown some stem cells that are coming from the bone marrow. So when you're making more fat tissue in your adult life, you're getting uh, adipocytes from the parasites, from endothelial cells, from the bone marrow. And also what's not shown here is that you can get it from the connective tissue as well. So if you damage the tissue, what is happening to your ability to create more adipocytes? Is it increasing it? Possibly. So this is a, a, a data from a single person and they looked very closely at the capillaries. So those are the smallest vessels in your body. So we were looking at the arterioles um, after the arterioles are capillaries and then post-capillary venules. So you can see that this 
capillaries surrounded by fat cells, one, two, three, four, five. And also right next to the capillary is some fluid that is entering the tissue. So this vessel looks like it's leaky. So it's probably been damaged. And if you look at it from the side, you can see that the walls are thickened and that is suggestive of long-standing chronic inflammation followed by fibrosis. And here's the post-capillary venule. So that's right over here it's dilated. So it's also damaged and leaky. So, you know, this was published back in 1986. So our group said, well, let's repeat that and look at more women with lipidema, not just one. So we published a paper looking at the vessels in the skin of women with lipidema. And this happens to be a woman with stage one lipidema. And you can see um, the surrounding connective tissue is pink. And then this kind of purpley rounded structure is your vessel and it has an extension up here forming another rounded structure. Now what you see around the vessel is white and that white is the leak, that's, that's fluid that's surrounding that vessel. And this is the exact same thing that you see in lymphedema. Also, you see a lot of these dots here. Those dots are immune cells. So there are, are more in, immune or inflammatory cells surrounding this vessel. And finally, another sign of leakiness, in addition to the fluid being present, the inflammatory cells, are the endothelial cells here have rounded up. And when the endothelial cells round up, they actually create a big space and fluid can just shoot out into the tissue. And when we quantitated that, we found that in uh, 21 women with lipidema versus controls, that there were more signs of leaky vessels in women with lipidema compared to the controls. So I think we've pretty much so established that there seem to be some leaky vessels in lipidema tissue, but in support, a paper that just came out um, of Vienna showed this data. And this is some of the coolest data I've seen in a long time. So what they did was they took our hypothesis and they said, you know, well, we showed that there were leaky vessels and, and they wanted to prove it. And if if you um, show some data in the literature, you really want people to try and prove um, right or wrong what you've done so that we can really understand the science behind lipidema. So they took uh, lipoaspirate. So liposuction, you know, whenever you get in your big container of liposuction, they took that what, what's called lipoaspirate. They digested away the mature fat cells and just got rid of them. And what was left was a whole bunch of other cells, um, immune cells, stem cells, um, and endothelial cells. So they isolated out those endothelial cells that we, we saw before, the lining of the vessel, and they grew them up in culture. And then they taught a computer program um, with uh, using artificial intelligence to identify endothelial cells that made a good connection to another endothelial cell. And the, this is called a tight junction where cells bond tightly together. And one of the proteins in that tight junction is called zonulin. And that's shown here as ZO-1, and it's in red. So zonulin is a good marker of a close interaction between cells. So they taught the um, computer program to identify close connections, and that would be more likely a control or a leaky connection, and that would more likely be lipedema. At least that was their hypothesis. So if you look on the top, the um, artificial intelligence said in, in these three control samples that there was a 60% chance, 62% chance, 66% chance that these cells made very good tight junctions, therefore they were most likely control. But look at the bottom in the samples that came from women with lipedema, there was a 74.3, 66.7, 99.9% chance that these were leaky endothelial cells. And they hadn't done anything to them, but grown them up in culture. So they said, why are these leaky? Let's look at this in a different way. So they took the lipoaspirate, got rid of the mature adipose cells and just took all the cells that they had and tossed them into a culture dish and grew them up in a liquid medium. And they grew them up for a certain period of time. And then they took the liquid medium off and they called that a secretome. And that means whatever those cells secreted into that fluid, that's what they took. 
Then they grew up um, normal human endothelial cells that you can buy from a company, grew those up in a culture dish and they threw on the secretome from the controls and they threw on the secretome from the lipidema tissue. And you can see here on the top for the control secretome added to the human endothelial cells, there was a 97.6, 99%, 97.1% that these cells did just fine. They weren't leaky, like they looked normal. You can see the beautiful red zonulin throughout. On the bottom though, when we looked at the lipidema secretome, there was a 98.8%, 86.9%, and a 96.2% that these endothelial cells became leaky because of what we took out of the lipidema tissue and dumped on top of them. Aha. So maybe it's not an inherent problem in the endothelial cells. Maybe it's something else. So I made a list of all the different things that could cause leaky vessels. And remember in the beginning, when we were looking at inflammation, look at that histamine. Histamine comes from mast cells. Could it be inflammation in the tissue itself causing the leaks in the vessel? Could it be parasite damage? Or could it be something being produced by the extracellular matrix? Or could it be something else altogether? So I'm sure this group is looking very closely at the different substances in that secretome from the lipidema tissue to figure out what this is. So that's something exciting to look forward to. When you have damage to your your blood vessels, especially your micro vessels. Normally you have a little bit of flow out and it's very well regulated, but when you have acute inflammation, you have a lot more flow out into the tissue. And these changes tend to develop slowly and it, they don't happen acutely. Like right when you um, develop inflammation, bam, these things happen. They take a while. So whenever you see problems with the vessels, this is chronic inflammation. And therefore I think uh, we can be assured that what we're looking at, at in, in lipidema tissue is chronic inflammation. So what causes that inflammation? Well, we have some ideas that there's something being secreted. We don't know what that is. So let's look at other things that can induce inflammation. So if I could go back in history, the one person that I would choose to meet, at least today, would be Hippocrates. And Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. So this is a quote from David Perlmutter. He's a functional doctor. Um, I think he's pretty good. Uh, he said, researchers have known for some time now that the cornerstone of all degenerative conditions, including brain disorders, is inflammation. But what they didn't have documented until now are the instigators of that inflammation, the first missteps that prompt this deadly reaction. And what they're finding out is that gluten and a high carb diet are among the most prominent stimulators of inflammatory pathways that reach the brain. So not only do they, not only does inflammation affect the body, but it extends to the brain. And I'm sure some of you have had those days where you think, you know, I, my brain's not working really well today. I'm not having, um, I'm not remembering things as well as I should, or I'm forgetting words. And then the next day you might feel better. So gluten and inflammation. So it's suspected that gluten proteins, along with other components of the wheat, activate an innate immune response in the body. And is this because of the way we grow our wheat? Is it because it's GMO? Is it because of all the pesticides? And, you know, I've, I've had different um, interactions with wheat from Europe compared to the US. So there's a lot of things that could be going on here, but at least while we're living in the US, this is what we're being exposed to. So people who have celiac disease, and then there's something called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, have gastrointestinal distress, fatigue, pain, and inflammation, and increased permeability of the intestinal mucosa or leaky gut. And when I was at um, the University of California, San Diego, that was back in, let's say I left there in 2013. So before then I would talk about leaky gut and people would tell me there's no such thing, but now we know that's clearly wrong, that, that there is such a thing as leaky gut. And if you look at people and their associated diseases who have celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, they have uh, a lot of um, mental health issues, including 
bipolar disease, major depressive disorder, anxiety, and autism spectrum disorders have also been ob observed to occur with these uh, gluten-associated diseases. So here's, here's your gut. And normally, number one, the physiology of it is normal. There's a, a mucus layer that uh, is right next to the, the gut cells shown in purple. And normally things are very well controlled when they're being transported across the uh, lining of, of our guts. But you can have anything from a minor barrier defect to just full blown leaky gut. You've been um, in a car accident and your gut is extremely permeable and you're going into multi-organ failure. So everything along a spectrum. So somebody could have increased gut permeability and feel just absolutely horrible. And someone could have increased gut permeability to a much lesser extent and not feel quite as bad and everything in between. So th this is one of those things where you don't, it's not a it's not black or white, it's a gray area. And when you have a defect in your lining, food particles come across and also parts of bacteria and viruses and whatever else you have in your gut also comes across. And that stimulates um, inflammatory cytokines and that can uh, result in chronic inflammation. It can result in increased allergies tissue damage and uh, what's called a breakage of tolerance, meaning you were tolerant to, to one kind of food at one time, but now you're not tolerant to it. So that your, if you ever do the immunoglobin G food test, which I'm gonna talk about, the foods that you react to can change over time. And that's because of the change in the permeability of the gut. So moving on to the brain, move this. I can't see. Okay. So many things can lead to chronic inflammation. As we know your genetics, and we're still learning so much about genetics and there's just not enough information right now for us. I wish there was more. If you've had childhood trauma that can lead to chronic inflammation, even trauma in adulthood, your your, your diet, the way you eat for you, not the way you eat because somebody else told you you should be eating that way, but the way you eat for you can affect um, you and induce chronic inflammation or not. If you have obesity um, that brings on inflammation, so you can have lipedema, but you can have obesity with it. And that brings on additional inflammation, which can worsen the lipedema. And, or if you have leaky gut for a variety of reasons, or you have another medical illness that can cause uh, chronic inflammation. This leads to multiple changes in uh, cytokine pathways, signaling pathways, neuroendocrine pathways, and that can lead to a feeling of uh, lack of motivation. Like, I don't feel like doing anything, or your just body feels heavy and you just can't get it to, to go and move forward. Um, so when your doctor says, why aren't you doing the things I tell you? And you could say, I have I've, I think I have chronic inflammation because I just don't feel like doing things like I used to before. You can get anxiety, it can impair your sleep, and that can all lead to um, changes in your immune system. So it shows T cell dysfunction here, but many other changes as well, including in the brain. So stress, depression, and inflammation. This is so interesting, and I think it's really um, under discussed, and it certainly can't be discussed in a clinical appointment with your doctor because you're worrying, worried about a lot of your physical things. But if you have stressors in your life, those, and again, from childhood on and everything in between, they can, those stressors activate key inflammatory pathways in your white blood cells. So your stress you experience actually changes your white blood cells so that they work differently and they start secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines. So you're, instead of your body mounting an immune response against a, a bacteria or COVID-19, it is actually mounting a response against your, your own self-esteem, you know, how you feel in your body. And the greater the inflammatory response to a psychosocial stressor, 
which may depend on the, the stressor itself, but also your genetics and what's going on in your life, the more likely you are to develop depression over the next few months. So again, the greater the inflammatory response, the greater your chance for developing depression. And the data supporting inflammation and its association with depression and anxiety are extensive. So the thought is that instead of giving people antidepressants, which change the neurotransmitters in the brain, what we should be focusing on are anti-inflammatory treatments to benefit people living with depression and anxiety. But my feeling is we should be developing anti-inflammatory treatments for people living with chronic disease and at risk for developing depression and anxiety. And it, this is out there in the general literature. This is a, a, quote, from a, a quote from a book um, by Mar Margaret Rogerson called The Sorcery of Thorns. And this is a young adult book and I can't see. Um, and the quote is, he snapped the notebook shut. I know all of this must be very frightening for you, but try not to agitate yourself excitement will only worsen the inflammation. She stared, the what? The inflammation of your brain, Miss Scrivener, he explained patiently, it is quite common among women who read novels. And the, the point is, there's a couple points here. One, in the past, women were always considered to be hysterical. And when we were treated for mental health issues, it was because our uterus was either moving around in our bodies or we were hysterical and we got treated for all sorts of different crazy things. But it also supports the fact that stress um, and excitement can also stimulate inflammation in the brain. So lipedema how is it related to secondary lymphedema and other lymphovascular disorders? And this is um, work out of Stan Roxon. And what they did was they, they took information from people with uh, lipedema, secondary lymphedema, lymphovascular disorders, and they looked at what other um, conditions they had. And so that's kind of one of the weaknesses of the study is it's really dependent on you know, they reviewed the, the medical charts. So people may not know some of the, di the diseases that they have. And I, I think you can look way down here on the bottom right. You can see lipedema in red. And you can see that there are only two things associated with lipedema, migraine and fibromyalgia. Whereas, you know, chronic pain is, is somewhere else. Hypothyroidism is somewhere else. Um, hyperthyroidism is somewhere else. So I, I'm not sure this is very accurate, but I, it definitely opens up an area of discussion because um, where are migraines in the brain? And then fibromyalgia is chronic pain in the body, but fi fibromyalgia also involves a central sensitization to pain in the brain. So it's interesting that lipedema is associated with two conditions that are within the brain, at least from this um, data. I think it would be good to do this again um, and not just as a chart review. So lipedema versus fibromyalgia. So we know that when you palpate the tissue of women with lipedema, they have a lot more tenderness in the connective tissue, in the subcutaneous adipose tissue, whereas people with fibromyalgia have more widespread pain. So they've got muscle pain, joint pain, uh, skin pain, just kind of pain where you touch anywhere. And also if you um, look at the comorbidities associated with lipedema versus fiber, fibromyalgia, women with fibromyalgia or people with fibromyalgia have many more comorbidities than women with lipedema. Women with lipedema generally tend to be healthier. And when you examine uh, people who have fibromyalgia versus women with lipedema, you find that people with fibromyalgia generally look pretty good. There, there are not many no, uh, abnormal signs on physical exam, but they have subjectively pronounced impairment. They have a lot of complaints 
a lot of sign, a, a lot of symptoms um, that they're complaining about is just not showing up on the physical exam. Whereas with lipedema, we can actually see the tissue. There's something not right about the tissue. And so um, again, I spoke of fibromyalgia as causing a pain centralization. So chronic pain in the body can actually centralize into the brain so that the brain actually continues to promote that pain. But it also changes the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis so that the fibers, the sympathetic fibers coming out of the brain are overactive and actually change signaling pathways within the tissue itself. And we have no data on that in lipedema. So that's something else that may be coming down the pipeline. And is fibromyalgia an immune disease? So is it just really a, a chronic disease um, of, of centralization of pain? So there is some data suggesting it may be an, an immune mediated disease. So they took a, a mouse model of fibromyalgia and they isolated the blood and out of the blood, they took their immunoglobin G autoantibodies. And they took those antibodies and put them into mice that didn't have fibromyalgia signs or symptoms. And those mice develop the same signs and symptoms as the mice model of fibromyalgia. So this is kind of reminiscent of when they took that secretome from lipedema and put it onto the endothelial cells and they asked, you know, was there a problem? This is kind of along the same line. So in this sense, lipedema and fibromyalgia may be similar and that's something in the, in the body that you can collect from a liquid can cause problems in a environment where there weren't problems before. And so I looked up in fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis, and I asked, you know, is there inflammation? What's the data there? Because if you read the literature too, you're gonna to find um, some places where it says there's no inflammation in fibromyalgia. But I thought this paper uh, was pretty good. It um, says that all three of these diseases have common features of inflammation. So if you look at C-reactive protein, which is a common marker of inflammation, it was elevated in chronic fatigue syndrome, um, ME, and also fibromyalgia. And even if you um, control for age and you control for body mass index, it didn't matter that CRP was elevated and high CRP levels are associated with depression as well. So I think I, I probably generated a bunch of areas of discussion, like for example, do women with lipedema have fibromyalgia and should we be testing for that? Um, do they not help have fibromyalgia? Are they being mistaken as fibromyalgia? Um, do they have them together at the same time? You know, I don't, I think this is an area that needs research and we don't have the answers to that. But, in, but kind of we're back to, there's a lot of inflammation in these chronic diseases. No matter what you have, it's really important to reduce the fire. So just kind of in a nutshell, I think one of the most important things, especially with the pandemic kind of still going and you're hearing that there's more COVID-19 cases again, but they're milder, but we're still doing a lot of Zooms, even for conferences. So I think it's really important that you empower yourself at home. So mental health, if you feel you have any mental health issues, you're struggling in any area, just even in, in taking care of your lipedema, I think it's important you find uh, mental health support and you can find that now via telemedicine. And there's uh, quite a few insurance companies that do support mental health care through telemedicine. And if, you, if you're open to that, you know, if you wanna be in person, you can too, that's, that's absolutely great. But I think it, um, having telemedicine at home and mental health care at home helps, saves you the trip in exposure to other people and also gas money. And then, of course, you want to find support in your friends, family, and online groups, including the monthly Lymphopress Lipidema Roundtable. And you want to use, utilize all the tools you have at home for self-care, your compression garments, your self-manual therapy and of any kind, um, your intermittent pneumatic compression pump, 
your muscle massagers, your gua sha and other tools you use to manipulate your tissue, your bathtub, you can put Epsom salts in there and move your tissue in the bathtub if you don't have a pool or you don't have a hot tub or warm tub or a cool tub. Uh, breathing exercise is super important. If you don't have a, a plan, you could just look up Vim Hof. He has a, a great breathing program on YouTube. Exercise, 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 movement of any kind, keep moving, eating well and sleeping well. And I think you can really reduce your stress using these tools from home. This is a study that came out of Dr. Amato from Brazil. Hopefully I got that right. And he used, he was a surgeon and he um, found out that he could actually uh, reduce the amount of adipose tissue on women with lipedema using an anti-inflammatory diet alone or followed by a low carb diet, aquatic exercise and manual lymphatic drainage. And then he gave them some antioxidant herbal med medicines, which Linda Ann Kahn and I and others have been recommending for years and years, like diazomin, quercetin, other flavonoids, rutacides, which we don't use a lot here in the US, but which you can easily get online, and butcher's broom. And this is just one picture from his paper showing um, uh, that this woman had a nice reduction in her lipidema tissue, and she felt better, and her pain went down. So this really supports that we can treat the inflammatory component of lipedema. And um, he feels, and I feel this way, and I think many other people feel this way, and I know Linda Ann Kahn does, that when, if you are planning on going into surgery for lipedema, it's super important to reduce your inflammation prior to getting the surgery because the outcomes are going to be so much better. You're gonna heal so much better and your tissue isn't going to be as inflamed, swollen, um, painful as if your inflammation was not reduced prior to the surgery. And you can work with a number of providers to get this done. So the low carb eating plan as Dr. Amato suggested. So just partial replacement of dietary carbohydrates by unsaturated fats. So healthy fats, not um, saturated fats like you'd find in dairy um, or um, non-grass fed beef, but unsaturated healthy fats prevented increased level of markers of systemic inflammation among women with metabolic syndrome. So I'm quoting this study because first of all, they use women. Secondly, they use women who had um, inflammatory markers that gave them metabolic syndrome, which is on the spectrum of prediabetes. And just by re partially reducing their dietary carbohydrates, they got benefit. This is the, the uh, keto diet that was published uh, recently in nine women with lipedema. They went on seven weeks of a eucaloric, low carb, high fat diet. And then they switched over to an isochloric diet. So the same number of calories, but not as low carb, high fat. And they lost weight. So they lost about eight pounds, nine pounds. Their pain went down by a visual analog scale. And they maintained their weight loss throughout the entire study, which is pretty amazing. However, their pain returned to baseline levels at week 13. And remember, they're switching over to an isochloric diet. So they're coming off this low carb, high fat diet. So it could be that maintaining that low carb, high fat diet kept their pain down. And when they switched off it, but kept their calories the same level, their pain came back, suggesting that low carb is a way to reduce pain. And that I think it's really important to find the low carb diet that fits you and your lifestyle and what you like so that you can maintain it because going on it and coming off it as they did for this study is actually going to make your pain come back or could potentially make your pain come back. Spices, one of the easiest ways to help reduce inflammation is to use spices in your food. And this uh, is a little complicated, but it's basically just showing that um, like cardamom, cinnamon, curcumin, turmeric, piperin or pepper, and actually white pepper is more anti-inflammatory than black. Quercetin, um, sesame, thyme, just all sorts of spices uh, reduce um, bad 
um, inflammatory cytokines and increase good anti-inflammatory cytokines to reduce chronic disease. So maybe just looking through your spice cabinet and thinking, what spice can I add to my food today? And omega-3 fatty acids, a great way to uh, reduce inflammation. So in this study, they used a, a special, um, it's, it's called um, special pro-resolving mediators that they got from uh, the omega fatty acids, DHA and DPA. And these SPMs are lipoxins, resolvins, protectins, and mericins. And they are small molecules from omega-3 fatty acids that actually reduce inflammation. And they're produced by, by the body from omega-3 fatty acids that are within our membranes to reduce inflammation. They protect the vasculature and they reduce overall systemic inflammation, including within the brain. And this particular study used um, SPM active by Metagenics and it, it helped regulate the peripheral blood mononucleosides to so the white blood cells and platelet activation and it made it better. It increased the ability of cells to phagos phagocytize, to take in and eat some of that debris in the tissue. So those macrophages started working better and it changed the cytokines that, that immune cells were secreting so they weren't as inflammatory. So spices, low carb diet, spices, and omega-3 fatty acids, three pretty um, general easy ways that you can empower yourself to reduce inflammation at home. Now, if you don't know what you should eliminate in terms of food, you can do um, an elim elimination provocation eating plan. So you basically eliminate inflammatory foods for one week to four weeks, and then you reintroduce them to see what happens. And you basically go by how you feel. How does your gut feel? How does your brain feel? How is your pain? And the, the common foods that create allergic or inflammatory reactions are listed below. We already talked about gluten. And if you are reacting to one of these, and not everyone will, but if you are reacting to one of them, if you eliminate them from your diet, you may find you lose a little weight, your swelling may go down, you just feel a little bit better, some of your chronic symptoms reduce. So gluten, dairy, corn, eggs, soy or nuts, nightshade, vegetables and fruits, citrus and yeast. So I, I kind of got into dairy and I asked myself, is dairy really um, inflammatory? Um, so this is a study showing that um, if you, anti-inflammatories in black and all these, if you are a healthy person with no real issues, dairy is anti-inflammatory for you. Um, in gray is like no real effect and in white is pro-inflammatory. So dairy is definitely anti-inflammatory for the general healthy population. And people with metabolic disease really didn't have much help whether you had it or not. And in people with um, gastrointestinal disorders, again, it, it really didn't do much. But in people who were reactive against dairy, if you eat dairy, you're going to enter a pro-inflammatory state. So I think the take-home message from this is that some people react to dairy and some don't. And you kind of want to try and find out if you're one of those people who react to dairy, because then, of course, you want to eliminate it. And this is a, a study um, by Dr. Cornelly from Germany. And he showed that women uh, with uh, lipedema and obesity could lose weight if they had bariatric surgery. And I have sent some women with lipedema and obesity to have bariatric surgery, and it was helpful. It's not gonna be helpful for, for a woman who just has lipedema. You have to have lipedema and, and obesity. And you can see that this woman has um, fat on her back and a, a lot of fat centrally compared to peripherally. She lost an incredible amount of weight, but she still had nubbins of lipedema tissue on her legs. So in this study, they lost about 73% of their excess weight, which is incredible. Their body mass index dropped, but their pain score did not change. So what I'm thinking from this study is it's great to get rid of that other um, inflammatory um, adipose tissue on the body, but you still have to reduce inflammation within the lipidema tissue. And that's gonna take something else like diet or other uh, supplements, especially food supplements. 
So you want to find out if you react to foods, how do you do that? You can do that elimination diet, as I mentioned, or you can do a uh, true allergy testing. And you can do this either by a blood test called RASP blood testing. You can see an allergist for skin prick or patch testing. And this is again for immunoglobin E, that's a true allergy to the food you're being tested for. Or you can look at IgG delayed allergy or delayed hypersensitivity reactions. And this is the test that a lot of traditional doctors don't like. It is not, it is not the best test, let's just say that. However, if, um, if you have it, if you don't have any of, if your, your IgE testing is normal and you're, you've done some elimination work and you're still trying to figure it out, I think it, it would be an okay test to go ahead and get. And the reason is because they did a study in people who had irritable bowel. So for three months, they um, consumed a diet excluding all foods to which they had raised immunoglobin G antibodies. So they did an elimination diet based on the IgG food allergy testing. And they had a significant improvement in their clinical signs than people who ate a sham diet. So in the sham diet, they excluded the same number of foods, but not those to which they had antibodies. So yeah, it's a, I would say it's a, it's a bottom tier for testing, um, but it can be useful for some people, especially if you have signs of irritable bowel syndrome. And if you find that on your IgG food allergy testing that you react to every single food, then you likely have leaky gut and your focus needs to be in improving the leaky gut that you have. So according to Mark Hyman, um, who is also a functional doctor, he said consuming a low allergy diet for just one week will help you eliminate your excess swelling and flu fluid that accumulates in your tissues from food-induced chronic inflammation. So one week seems reasonable to me. So in conclusion, depression may be a sign that you have inflammation, and I really think it's important to get help. I would actually add on here, if you have depression, anxiety, or you're just, you're struggling, you're, you're in a stress mode, get help, and that includes telemedicine but also includes supports in, in group like this. And if you think you have an allergy to any food, get tested. Ask your PCP to refer you to an allergist. Your P PCP can even start with that RAST blood test. And again, an elimination diet for just one week can help you identify foods that may be causing a leaky gut. Lowering carbohydrates, especially processed carbohydrates, bread, pasta, is one of the most important things you can do. And we saw that zonulins were important in the adhesion of the endothelial cells, but zonulins are important in the gut to prevent leakage in the gut. So could zonulins be important in the pathophysiology of lipedema? And doing research into zonulins is really fun. Make sure your inflammation is as low as possible before you have any surgery, before you undertake anything new, even if it's not surgery. And Ladies, you can do this because you are ladies of steel. And I say that because of this quote by Richard Nixon, the finest steel has to go through the hottest fire. So thank you so much. I love that quote that you ended with. And I also, first of all, Dr. Herbst, thank you so much. That was brilliant, comprehensive, thought-provoking. And I learn something new every time you speak. Zonulin is a new word I've added to my vocabulary. I'm going to have to incorporate that into the next dinner party conversation. And I also, before we get to the many questions, I want to thank you for mentioning the Lipedema Patient Roundtables sponsored by Lympha Press. We do them every third Wednesday of every month. And it's our way of saying, yes, we will provide you with the most advanced pneumatic compression pump therapy for you or your patients. But along with that, we will walk with your patients and provide them emotional support, information. Dr. Herbst has been known to show up at the roundtables and grace us with her wisdom and presence. We've got the top social influencers in the world of lipedema that show up every month. People that you can relate to, and there's candid talk. 
And so we invite you. In fact, I'm going to put in chat right now the link to our link tree where you can sign up for any of Lympha Press events and um, webinars. But let's go to the questions, Dr. Herbst. From one of our anonymous attendees, do leaky vessels mean there is more edema in the tissue? Okay, so uh, thank you for that question. Um, I am going to share my screen again. And this is something I did not um, share, but do this, okay. This is a, a paper that just came out from John Rasmussen, Eva Sevic, myself, Carolyn Fife, And yes, so if you have leaky vessels, you definitely are putting more fluid into the tissue and your glycosaminoglycans are binding up that tissue as fast as they can to because they don't want your poor little cells to drown in fluid. But also what we think is happening is the lymphatics are pumping at a much higher rate. So you can see the rate of pumping in women with stage one, stage two, stage three lipedema is much higher than controls or women who don't have lipedema. So I think this, is, this supports the fact that there is more fluid in the tissue. And we think that um, actually Shelly Krasinski just published a paper, I could show that too, um, showing that there is edema and lipedema tissue. So I do think there's some free fluid in the lipedema tissue, but there's a lot of it also bound up to the glycosaminoglycans and the lymphatic vessels are working so hard. They're, they're also starting to dilate. So they showed pooling of a lymphatic fluid within the lymphatic vasculature. So even though they're pumping really hard, they're starting to wear out. And the longer you have lipedema, the greater chance you have for lymphatic dysfunction and for more fluid to build up in that interstitial space. Mm. Thank you for that answer and excellent question. And you just had a slide just ready to go. You're amazing. I'll get right out. All right. Well, Jess Fisher asks, would taking an over-the-counter antihistamine allergy pill help with the histamine that causes inflammation? Very excellent question. So what, um, so I, um, if you were at the Fat Disorders Resource Society Conference in April, we had uh, an eminent speaker, Dr. Larry Afrin, who talked on mast cells. And mast cells are one of the cells that secrete histamine. If you're going to take something to treat excess histamine in the tissue, you really wanna know that your mast cells are overactive. So the best thing to do is to find a mast cell expert that would be an allergist or an immunologist and get blood and urine testing to find out if your mast cells are overactive. And the reason for that is if you try an antihistamine over the counter and, and it doesn't work, does that mean that you don't have mast cell activation? Maybe not. And if you actually react to the over the counter allergy medication because your mast cells are so overactive and they're reacting to one of those excipient ingredients, then you'll say, oh, I, I can't take that. I stopped. But there might be another manufacturer who makes that particular uh, antihistamine without some of the gook in it that you're reacting to. So it, it's actually kind of complex. So I'm not sure I would tell anyone, oh, just go take some antihistamines and that'll, that's going to solve your problem because the inflammatory pathways are so complex. You really want a partner to, to help you through it. Can I just say how much I appreciate that you are brilliant and yet you use words like gook? <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes all of us feel a little more comfortable. We know that we have both patients and medical professionals out there. And I love that your content speaks to everyone, no matter what their level of expertise or education is. Gook is a term I understand. Um, so you really did toward the end of your presentation speak to this, but we also had a question, is there a suggested diet to recommend for patients that have chronic inflammation of the gut? You were pretty clear about some of the things to avoid, but you also said not every body is the same and doesn't respond the same. Right. One of the, you know, you know, I've, I've had some women have super success on the keto diet, but what I found is some of them will go on the keto diet and then they'll go off the keto diet and they'll gain a bunch of weight. And then that weight becomes hard to lose. So 
I don't, I don't like to call them diets. I call them, you know, eating, like how, how do you eat now? Mm -hmm. Because you want to find a way to eat that pleases you, that you can, you can, that's not going to be too difficult for you to do. Like if you go out to restaurants all the time, you've got to figure out how to eat at restaurants all the time. So having a provider, like a nutritionist help you uh, at least through part of your journey um, so that they can provide you tools and tips, but also making sure that whatever you start, this is something that you're planning to stick to. And whether it's a super low carb, moderate low carb, mildly low carb, you know, whatever step you decide to take is personalized for you. And what works for one person doesn't work for another, because as we saw, your genetics also impact how you respond. So someone who does fabulously on keto, there might be another um, lady with lipedema who looks almost the same, same age, everything. And she's not responding the same way. What is going on? And that's where you really just need someone to kind of help you figure out maybe you have other causes of inflammation that we need to address first to allow you to respond to uh, a particular diet. Excellent. I could already long winded, but no, 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 that was great. And actually we're going to begin doing a series on our lympho press social channels, ask Dr. Herbst. And I think some of these questions make perfect fodder to help promote because they're common questions that a lot of people have. Yeah. This is a drill down question about what to avoid when it comes to nightshades. Corinne Burchett, thank you so much for being with us today, Corinne. She says, okay, I understand tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, but what does bell peppers one mean? Um, that's a great question. I'm not sure what bell peppers one means, but bell peppers in general, now there's different bell peppers, right? There's green and then they can become yellow or orange and then they can become red. Um, some people find they tolerate uh, red bell peppers better than green bell peppers. So again, it's it's kind of what you experiment and what you learn about yourself. You may tolerate one bell pepper versus another because those colors are are different flavonoids and carotenoids in the in the isn't it a fruit? Aren't bell peppers a fruit? I don't know, fruit, vegetable, but food stuff. And and so I would, you know, if you're gonna eliminate bell peppers as a starter or nightshades as a start, all bell peppers, eliminate them all. And then you could start bringing uh, one colored bell pepper in, back in versus another. Good, great advice. So do we know why lipedema patients have pain? Is it related to the inflammation? I, I definitely think it's related to the inflammation. I think that you know, let's, let's just go out on the, on the as Lindy McCutcheon says, the skinny branches. I, I really think this, that lipedema really starts from an inflammatory event. There may be, you know, like fibromyalgia, there's an immune component to it. Now we know that in lipedema, there's actually something you can take out of the fluid and transfer and create, I mean, lipedema, I mean, now maybe they could, they could use a mouse model and, and they could, they could figure, figure this out, you know, a lot faster. Not that I support experimentation on animals, but, um, you know, but but somebody's going to do it. I can, I, I can bet you that. I was fascinated by what you shared about childhood trauma, mm -hmm. being a, a, a connecting the dot kind of situation. There's so much that we could dig into. We could do actual entire hours on some of these comments, but we have a couple of Durkham's comments oh. and questions that came in. Michael Peltier, thank you for being with us today, Michael, asks, does Durkham's disease play into lipedema research and such as was discussed today. Sure, so I think Durkham's disease is in the spectrum of lipedema. It's probably, um, it involves slightly different inflammatory components than lipedema. So you could call it lipedema on steroids in a way. And I think there's a bigger inflammatory fascial component to Durkham's disease, but, Lipedema also has that too, has the inflammation of the fascia as well, the connective tissue, because adipose tissue is connective tissue. But I think it's just amped up in uh, Durkham's disease. And so a follow-up question or to expand on that, Sherry Simmons is asking, how can I tell the difference between lipedema, Durkham's lumps, and inflamed lymph nodes on my body? 
So inflamed lymph nodes are gonna be in the classic lymph node locations on your neck, under your armpits, um, by your elbows, uh, around your knees, in your groin. And they're gonna be more oval, like a football. And they shouldn't be hard. If they're hard, you need to point that out to your uh, provider right away. Um, tell, Durkheim's disease and lipedema, again, I, I published a research study on this. And in some of the people, like 6.6% .6 of the people, I couldn't tell the difference. Did they have lipedema, Durkheim's disease, or both? So in my experience, uh, you've got to look at the history. When did those lumps form and where did they form? If they formed primarily first on the trunk, it's more likely Durkheim's disease. If they formed primarily on the hips, thighs, buttocks, or maybe even the upper arms, it's more likely lipedema. What is the pain level? People with uh, Durkheim's disease have more pain disorders. Migraines, although you know now we know those may be associated with lipedema, abdominal pain, big deal in Durkheim's disease. Um, and just in other just pain disorders in general, and they're more likely to have fibromyalgia. And I've done some fibromyalgia blood testing on people with Durkheim's disease, and pretty much so they all come back positive. So wow. there's some sort of you know immune component to Durkheim's disease, and it and it's on a spectrum, and you just need a good physical exam by a provider who knows both. So this question is a little heartbreaking, and I don't even think that we have an answer for the actual question, but let me share what this anonymous attendee wrote. My primary care doctor says fibromyalgia is a mental disorder. And when she was diagnosed with fibromyalgia 30 years ago, it was actually the beginning of the Durkheim's disease. She never had painful lumps until about six years ago. And her question is, do I need to get a new doctor? You are speaking to the fact that finding the right person to diagnose and treat you is critical. So right. I, I think the question, she's answering her own question here. Yeah, and you really already are. answered it. Yeah. And, and I think you know from today now that there are some data showing that fibromyalgia is an inflammatory disease. So I think you can hold on to that. Um, and, you know, lumpy tissue is a marker of inflammation. So you could have had brewing inflammation for a long time. You just didn't notice it. But as, as inflammation persists, you are going to get bigger and bigger lumps, more and more swelling, more and more pain. And I think you just explain that you went through the traditional inflammatory pathway and, and here you are. And I think, you know, I'm not saying get rid of your provider because they may be a good provider, but just maybe try and get a second opinion. And also a patient question. I can hear the frustration in this. What is your advice on getting our treating doctors and specialists to listen to these issues, tips, and questions? Um, Michael Pelche says, many of us feel that we've been shoved off to someone else for care and treatment. They don't know that lipedema, mast cell, and more are what they are, and they won't research or investigate. What can we do? I know that one of the things we that has been critical for patients is being able to print out or get on their phone and share the standard of care for lipedema in the United mm -hmm. States, because many of the things that you shared, including pneumatic compression, were included in that standard of care. What can patients do to highlight the need for the, the fact that they need attention? Yeah, so I, I know that, that caring for people with chronic disease and not just lipedema Durkheim's disease is a problem in our healthcare system because we're given so little time that we can only do one or two things at a t at least the, the, I, I have more time with my patients, but the regular PCP has 10, 15 minutes with you, that's it. So they're gonna do one or two things for you and shove you out the door. So I think, probably the best thing that you can do is to focus on, on one thing that's really important to you and try and get a referral to another, especially a specialist. So if you think you have an inflammatory condition, maybe a rheumatologist would be a good place to go and maybe a dermatologist uh, would be a good place to go. Um, just try and get, uh, build a team, build a team of people, get, find a therapist that helps you so that you can 
get all the therapies that you deserve. And then when they run out, you know that you still have that therapist and you will go back to them. So I think it, you can't just have one provider taking care of someone with chronic disease. You need to have a team. And my patients that are the happiest tell me I built a good team. Ah, oh, that's awesome. And remember, be resilient, be your own advocate. Don't give up. I interviewed a woman recently. She waited 30 years to get a diagnosis and now she has her lympha press. She is managing her condition and it's helped her mental health too, because she knows that instead of lipedema controlling her, she is controlling it. So I know we, we could go on and on and on forever, Dr. Herbst. I want to get through these final questions and one from Katie Taylor, why are compression garments important? What does the data say? So the data for compression garments say that they definitely help reduce pain and they, if they help maintain the benefits from your treatment. So if you, for example, use a, a pump and you pump out a bunch of fluid and, and the gook in the tissue, and you put your compression garments on, then they're gonna help maintain the, the lower levels of fluid and all the, other, all the other gook in the tissue. So, and they also, they help you move and walk. If you have some fat lobules that are um, sticking out medially on your legs and you have a hard time getting your legs around each other, they help kind of shape those and, and smooth those out. Um, and they, they have, um, they've been shown to have multiple benefits. So reducing fluid and tissue, maintaining treatment benefits, reducing pain, improving mobility. So I think they're definitely worth it. It's compression again is like eating. It's very personalized. You have to find the right um, compression garment for you because you don't want it to, to dig into your tissue. You want to be able to get it on effectively and get it off effectively without hurting your fingers. Yeah. I love that you're showing this slide again. The finest steel has to go through the hottest fire. That's a great uh, way to continue to encourage our audience. I didn't know if there's another slide that you wanted to go to, but I, no, just, I just love that one. I just want to keep showing this one. I agree. Let's make that our mantra. Because you know what, whether you have lipedema or treat people with lipedema, or you're just a human being, you've gone through some stuff. Yeah. So remember, it's making you strong. Is there any correlation, by the way, with liver disease and lymphatic disease? Yes. So if you, so your liver contributes about 50% of the lymph fluid that goes through your thoracic duct in your chest. So 50% of the fluid, the lymph fluid that's returning back to the venous system. If you have fatty liver, if you have liver cirrhosis, if you have liver inflammation, the amount of that fluid goes up. So liver disease definitely contributes to the overall amount of fluid in your body. Okay, great answer there. And by the way, there is a lot of interest in mast cell. And I want to just alert everyone that we do have a webinar coming up on August 22nd, 1230 Eastern Standard Time with Linda Ann Kahn, a close associate of Dr. Herbst, one of the authors of the standard of care for lipedema in the United States. So please go to that link tree that's in chat and sign up for that webinar because that's going to be excellent as well. Alexandria Escalera. Oh, I love that name. I want to go samba dancing or something. What research has been done to understand the parasitic connection in connective tissue disorders? And what anti-parasitic medications would you recommend? Are you talking about a parasite or the P-E-R-I-C-Y-T-E? So she writes out parasitic. So it's actual parasites in the body. Huh? Hmm. So I, the only, okay, I'm not a parasite expert, um, but the research that I come on basically says that um, we are, we have been, we have put ourselves in a very clean environment. So we don't have a lot of exposure to um, parasites. And so our system has kind of 
adapted in a different way. And it really has affected our ability to, to react or has caused us to overreact to um, our environment. So instead of spending some of our um, immune cell energy on, on taking care of the parasites that we're exposed to, our immune system is like, I have nothing to do. I think I'll go attack my own body. So, that, you know, that, that's about all I know. And when you, uh, you know, if you, so I think it's, there's an increase in amount of autoimmune disease, allergies, because of our lack of exposure to the things that we were exposed to for thousands of years in the past. Mm. And that can certainly affect your, your tissue in general. So mold, how about mold? Mold is definitely, uh, can cause allergies and um, can, it's one of the inflammatory triggers for chronic disease. So reducing your exposure to mold is a big deal. And, you know, you may not know you're exposed to mold. You kind of have to search for it in your house, especially if you have an older house or you're, you, you know, like you might be exposed to mold in, in a, a different building where you work. And sometimes mm. you can't escape it. And so you're just going to chronically be exposed to something that's really um, causing leaky gut and high, higher levels of inflammation. So mold is a big deal. It is. And final question, because we could keep going for the rest of the afternoon here. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, everybody wants to know, will this be posted? Yes, 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 yes. This will be posted on our YouTube channel on LymphaPress. It'll be on all of our social channels. You can get to the link. It will eventually be on our website. And everybody that has registered will receive a link to the replay. So I know you're going to want to watch this over again and again. Angela White, final question. What are tests that we can undertake to assess chronic systemic inflammation? Would, to ta would taking disease modifying therapies that affect T cell and B cell function to reduce disease specific inflammation have any impact upon chronic inflammation or would they merely shift the inflammation from one type slash target to another? That was a mouthful of a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you for handling it, Dr. Herbst. tests to undertake to assess chronic systemic inflammation. And I see that on my screen, Dr. Herbst has frozen. So maybe that was a cue that we need to wrap this up. Uh, I, I know that we definitely put Dr. Herbst through the hoops today and she was more than gracious to answer so many things. I, oh, you're back. You're oh, sorry. Rose. No, I thought you went. Rose. So can Maybe. you just, can you just repeat the first sentence of the question? I would love to repeat it. And this, this is, is the first right. sentence. Absolutely. What are tests that we can undertake okay, to assess chronic okay. systemic inflammation? Okay. So um, I mentioned in the talk, uh, C-reactive protein, that's um, a marker of actual repair. So that um, like macrophage stage of inflammation. So CRP would be a good one. Um, ESR or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Um, you can get uh, a measure of complement proteins like C3 and C4. You can get a D-dimer level as, as a marker of subclinical clot formation. Um, you could get a platelet factor for um, to help um, support, although, you know, again, it's, it's really in a research um, based phase. You can look at your white blood cells and see if any are um, too high or too low. You can look at your IgM, your IgE, your IgG to see if you have um, normal levels of those. You can look at your subclasses of IgG, your IgG 1, 2, 3, 4. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can look at, probably best done by a rheumatologist if you're looking for hidden inflammation. But there are very few rheumatologists out in the world. I'm not sure they would see you just to search for inflammation. They would want to know why they're seeing you. And then um, would disease modifying medications be useful? They would be if you figured out that you had some markers that were high and that were definitely causing you problems. And those medications are not without side effects. And one of them is 
um, infections and infections that can put you in the hospital. So you do not take those lightly. And I just feel like we need a little bit more information in lipedema before we start um, using those agents. Those are often used for things like lupus and when there, where there are severe consequences of having lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and things like that. So, uh, so you know, classic autoimmune diseases that cause damage to the body. Dr. Herbst, your devotion and dedication to this topic, to this condition, to raising the banner and working with such amazing people who many of them have joined us on today's webinar, like Linda Ancon, like Kathleen Listen, so many others. You give hope to people. And that's why we're so honored and proud to work with you. I can't thank you enough for your time. Thank you, audience. You've been so engaged. Your questions have been invigorating. This was amazing. And we look forward to sharing it over and over again to help continue to underscore the importance of attention to this. And again, Great yeah. job, Dr. Herb. So I'm applauding and I think the whole audience is too. We've got so many people in chat saying, thank you, Dr. Herbst. Thank you, Dr. Herbst. And I'm right there along with them. Thank so you everybody for coming and attending and um, happy Lipedema Awareness Month. It's still going on. That's right. That's right. And it's every month at Lympha Press. We hope to see you at an upcoming webinar, roundtable, or other event. And to, to end it all, have a great day, everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.